chicken or the egg? The mode or modal jazz? Which came first? Well, the mode, obviously, but let's learn one. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone master classes and product reviews, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button. You'll play just a little bit better. Now today we're talking about the Dorian mode, what it is, how to play it, give you plenty of exercises to build technique, and then we're gonna also apply it in context over Joe Henderson's Recordame. We're gonna talk about playing it over the chord changes, give us some examples of how to make it more interesting and how to build a solo using the Dorian mode. Now this is continuing our lesson on Joe Henderson's Recordame. This is part two. So make sure you download the lead sheet. I'll put it in the description where we have the chord chart so you can follow along. And you'll also see a full performance of our tune, Farcaster, the duet you get to download for free. And you can see our examples in context over these chord changes. So let's talk just a little bit about modal jazz, hitting the scene big in 1958 with the release of Miles Davis's Kind of Blue with John Coltrane and Cannibal Adderley on saxophones. Huge landmark recording, and to this day is the best-selling jazz album of all time. Every year it's the best-selling jazz album of all time, and for good reason. It's amazing. Now that is an early example of modal jazz. There have been many since, and it became even more popular in the 1960s. Players like John Coltrane and Wayne Shorter continued with that, writing even what we consider standards now, like footprints, impressions, and So What from Kind of Blue are commonly called at jam sessions and they're becoming part of the standard repertoire of jazz language. And one of the things they have in common is liberal use of the Dorian mode. Mode, modal jazz, you can see the connection. And part of the reason we use the Dorian mode or it's such a great vehicle in modal jazz is because in modal jazz, we don't have so much functional harmony, lots of chord changes, a vertical series of chord changes pulling to one another, we have long stretches of a single key area, often a single chord. And in this tune, uh, Recordame, like many other modal jazz standards, it's one single minor seventh chord. And we're gonna see today how powerful the Dorian mode is creating interesting melodic lines over that chord sound. So how do we make a Dorian mode? How is it built? Well, it corresponds to the major scale. It's built off the second scale degree. So this A Dorian mode is the second scale degree of G major, which means we're gonna have one sharp, just like the key of G major. If we are building it off the C major scale, it's D Dorian. The D Dorian mode has no sharps or flats, just like C major. So if you ever see a Dorian mode and you wanna know how many sharps or flats, just go down a whole step, and that's the corresponding major key. And pay particularly close attention to the intervals in between the notes. They're either gonna be a whole step or a half step, but their placement, the placement of the whole step and the half step between the tones makes a major sound like major, minor sound like minor, and the Dorian and various other modes sound like whatever they sound like. So let's take a look at how it's built with the intervallic context. First, we have a whole step, then a half step, then a whole step, then a whole step, then a whole step, then a half step, and then a whole step. So it sounds like this. Now, what's really important about this is the distance between the tonic, the first note, and the third note is a minor third, which is why this Dorian mode fits so beautifully over minor chords. The other critical thing we need to know about the Dorian mode is it does not have a leading tone. What I mean is the second to last note leading back to the tonic, the octave, is a whole step, not a half step. The major scale has a half step, a leading tone, which leads and pulls back home. So for instance, let's hear the A Dorian. Now let's hear the A major scale, listening for that seventh scale degree. Do you hear how it kind of want to pulls back home? That G sharp wants to go home. Go home, G sharp, you gotta pull to A. 
The Dorian mode doesn't really sound like that. It has more of a floating, ethereal quality where you can land and stop and pause on any of the tones and you don't feel a strong pull back to tonic, which makes it a great vehicle for soloing over modal jazz. So let's get you into some exercises playing this and some homework for practicing. Now with major or harmonic minor scales, I recommend my students do them all the way through the full range of the instrument, two times through slurred. For modes, because of, well, a lot of reasons, it's a discussion of another time, I don't necessarily think we need to do them full range. I think practicing from the tonic to the ninth scale degree and back down is going to be a great way to do it. So today we're gonna to learn the play the A mode, the A Dorian rather, that way. Then we're gonna show you how to build speed and technique using isolation, repetition, and building chains and linking them together. So from slow to fast, I'm just going to demonstrate how I would practice this. Now you can be assured there is a metronome clicking in my headphones. Anytime you practice this, the metronome had better be clicking. So we take a small bit, speed it up, add another bit, put them together. Add another bit, put it together. Take another segment of the chain and then link them together. Sequential and additive as you practice, always slow to fast with the metronome and start to build on a place of success, adding more and more as you go. And one of the big reasons we practice small segmented chunks is to make sure we're hitting the landmarks. We see which of the notes falls on the beat. It's like rungs of a ladder. We want those landing points and it's critically important as you're practicing, you're not practicing around the metronome, not sort of with the metronome, but those down beats are lining up precisely with the metronome. And that's how we're gonna really build some solid technique. So once you've practiced that, you should have a solid technique and be comfortable with this mode. Now let's talk about how to use it. So looking at the chord changes to record a May, we see something that makes our brains very happy. One chord for a long period of time, and the mode, that thing that we've just learned, fits so beautifully over it, it's a Dorian playground. But that also has something that's gonna make our brains sad. It can get boring very quickly. So how do we make it interesting? Well, last week we talked about using melodic sequencing to create interest. If you haven't seen that lesson, you should go check out part one of this. Uh, melodic sequences. In this lesson, we're going to focus on a key rhythmic distinction, syncopation. How to use that, how to use rhythmic interest in your solos. So first, let's check out Joe Henderson. Let's see what the master does. Here is a little bit of his solo transcribed, what he's playing over the A section. Now we're gonna listen again. I want you to pay close attention to the rhythmic 
syncopation. Joel Henderson shows us that playing a solo is not merely outlining chords as building melodic content, but rhythm is so important here. Look at the macro rhythm of the line. Look where he's placing the syncopation, the accented syncopations, and how that flows in the overall melodic line. It's very interesting, makes it very fun to listen to. And rhythm is one of the telltale signs of a beginning improviser versus a master or more experienced improviser. The beginners that don't listen enough to jazz generally seem to put everything on the downbeats. They have the da 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 ba da ba da 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 ba da rhythm going all the time, like raindrops keep falling on my head. They improvise that way because they don't have the master key listening in their ear. If you listen to enough Joe Henderson, you don't have to consciously think about adding syncopation to your solos. It will begin to happen somewhat naturally. And that was the case when my band went into the studio and we recorded our contrafact over the chord changes that recorded me. We weren't consciously thinking we need to add syncopation. We just improvised solos. And sure enough, when we transcribed them after the fact, we found we were very much using like syncopation being that we listen quite a bit to Joe Henderson. So let's look at an example. So this is the opening line of the solo I played in the studio, not consciously trying to prove a pedagogical point, though someone hoping one might come out. And as you can see, there's a lot of syncopation. So let's listen to it first slowly and notice where the accents are, where the strong offbeats are happening. <laughs> And now let's hear it in context with the whole band, the Sonarnauts. Now let's hear another example of my friend and tenor saxophonist, Christopher Peebles, his improvised solo. And once again, we're gonna hear a lot of use of syncopation Listen to how he uses that over the opening of his improvised solo. Now to be clear, Chris and I don't have to make a conscious decision to use syncopation. It's part of our Vocabulary. If you're a native speaker of a language, you listen enough and speak and you're surrounded, you're enveloped in context, you don't have to think about these things. It's like being immersed in a language. You don't think about verb placement. You listen and hear it and speak it enough, it just happens. So be patient with yourself, but start to copy Joe Henderson's line. Use our lines that we have notated here as an example and start to apply those concepts in your own soloing. Small, isolated repetition of a key area, put on one chord on a vamp in iReal Pro, and practice. Maybe just take the outlining rhythm, create a little rhythmic exercise for yourself, and use the Dorian mode and have fun. Now, once you give it a go and get creative, let me know in the comments below what you found interesting or rhythmic solos that really float your boat. I will see you next week where we're going to dive into the minor blues. It's going to be a very fun lesson. We're going to talk about Lou Donaldson Blues Walk and have more free duet goodies for you. So until then, I hope you have a most wonderful weekend and you better go practice. <laughs>